What's up, Lions of Liberty fans? You can now support this show on Patreon and get exclusive access to bonus audio and video content, including Conspiracy Corner, Degenerate Gamblers, bonus segments with guests, and so much more. Head on over to patreon.com slash Lions of Liberty. Welcome to Felony Friday, a presentation of the Lions of Liberty podcast. Here is your host, John Odermatt. Felons, friends, and freedom lovers, welcome back to another edition of Felony Friday, a weekly show right here on the Lions of Liberty podcast. Of course, Felony Friday is the only show where each and every single week we focus We zero in, we laser in on the criminal justice system, and we shine a light on injustice within the system. Um, We share stories of people who've firsthand been through this prison industrial complex, suffered from these unjust laws, and come out on the other side to achieve great things. I have one of those stories for you today. We're going to get to that in just a minute here. It's an incredible story. Before we do that, I want to let you guys know the show notes page for this episode is at lionsofliberty.com slash FF152 because it's episode 152. Also, there's two other shows on the Lions of Liberty podcast feed. Every Monday, there is a show hosted by Mark Clare. It's our longest running program, our flagship program. Mark hosts, uh, Mark interviews leaders in the libertarian movement and he hosts roundtable discussions. We have one of those roundtable discussions coming up this Monday, and it's a fan favorite episode, fan favorite format, I should say. It's called our Liberty Draft. What it is, it's the group of Lions of Liberty contributors, myself, Mark, Brian McWilliams, Howie Snowden, J.B. Lubin, and the elusive legal counsel, Rico, will all be drafting Liberty teams. So what we're doing is we're picking, going forward, looking forward to 2020, what players in the Liberty movement are going to have big impacts, are going to make waves, are going to shake things up, are going to set the course, change the course of history going forward. So we're going to be, we're going to be picking positions like uh, who could be the libertarian uh, presidential candidate, vice presidential candidate, who's, who's one of the best libertarian podcasters, who's a great influencer, and other things like that. We're picking a Liberty All-Star team. It's like a fantasy football draft, but with libertarians. And we're putting, the first time we did it, We took Ron Paul and Rand Paul off the board. Uh, We're lifting all those restrictions. Nobody is off the board. Nobody's off limits. You can pick anybody you want. So that's going to be a lot of fun. That is this Monday. So be sure to subscribe uh, to the Lions of Liberty podcast on whatever podcatcher you use. I'm not going to name them. If you found this podcast, you can subscribe and uh, get them all delivered to your phone. So that's Monday. Wednesday, every single Wednesday, we have Electric Liberty Land hosted by Brian McWilliams. It's your weekly shot of culture, comedy, and liberty. Brian just had his 100th show of Electric Liberty Land. That is a tremendous accomplishment. And as a fellow podcaster who is now at episode 152, I know even getting past five shows is a struggle for a lot of people. But here at the Lions of Liberty, all three of us, Mark, Brian, and myself, We've flew, flown, we've, I guess, flown, is that right? Flown right past that milestone, and uh, we are on our way to thousands upon thousands of episodes. So we'll keep making them as long as you guys keep listening. Just one more quick note before I introduce today's guest. I want to tell you guys about a free market alternative to healthcare insurance. So healthcare insurance, as you know, with Obamacare, with the market being just a a cartelized mess, there's ways around it. There's better ways. Um, there's something out there called health sharing. And there is um, this great group called Health Excellence Plus. And what they're doing, it's a free market alternative. It's a way to pull your money together for health costs, for health care costs. Save money. You don't have these high premiums, these high deductibles, all this other crap. Uh, you can pay for, pay for things that you need and save money, not doing these ridiculous expenditures that a lot of this money doesn't even go to treating your health care. So you can check this out at lionsofliberty.com slash health. All right, time for uh, introducing today's guest. My guest today on Felony Friday is Lisa Hanna. Lisa is a U.S. Army veteran, having served two 
tours overseas. She's a graduate of Thomas M. Cooley Law School back in 1993. However, after or a little bit before graduating from, from uh, law school, she suffered a uh, very tragic loss when her son passed away. Uh, this led into a downward spiral of drugs and alcohol, which became a way for Lisa to self-medicate and numb that depression. Um, she did eventually get clean and left an abusive relationship that we should, that she was in at the time with her then husband Scott. Uh, however, a little bit after that, Scott was busted with meth and marked bills and stolen guns. And as a part of his agreement with uh, prosecutors to cooperate in exchange for that, he claimed uh, that Lisa was the source. Uh, for the meth, which she claims is not true. Lisa was charged with conspiracy to possess with intent to distribute a substance containing methamphetamine. She served more than 15 years in federal prison. And while in prison, Lisa wrote a book called Prison Bitch, which is a humorous memoir covering her time inside federal female camps and prisons. Lisa, welcome to Felony Friday. Thank you. I'm really happy to be here. Well, we're happy to have you on the show Our mutual friend, um, Malik, introduced us, which he's done with so many of my guests on Felony Friday. I'm always so thankful to uh, to Malik King for for setting these interviews up. And you had uh, showed me an interview that you did recently on a Facebook Live with another gentleman, which was I was just blown away by your story. And after after seeing that and reading reading your story on the uh, the can the Can Do Foundation website, you know I, I was just blown away. It's truly a remarkable. Story and I I want to get into the, the details of that everything you you've been through which is just crazy um, but before we do that I'd like to give my audience my listeners a little bit of a just background on you you know um, where you're from where you grew up that type of information I'm a Michigan girl I was born in Battle Creek and raised in Branch County which is um, down on the Indiana line small town small community. I um, decided, you know, I grew up pretty poor. Um, My parents got their GEDs when they were 31, so I wasn't really pushed to go to school or anything, but I decided from the age where little girls want to be teachers and nurses and mommies, I wanted to be a lawyer. So I graduated when I was 16, and I joined the Army as soon as I turned 17, and I joined to be a legal specialist and became a court reporter. And I did that for five years overseas in Fort Hood, Texas, and uh, had my son the first time I was in Germany. And then when I got out, I went to college and law school. My life was pretty normal. And then... Um, Not to cut you off, but what, uh, what motivated you to join the Army? Is that something you always wanted to do, or what, what pulled you to that To get direction? out of my small town. Yeah. Which it, it's funny how things turn around because after all that time in prison, I'm like, nobody can, wild horses can't get me out of Coldwater, Michigan. You know, <laughs> this is where I'm <laughs> going to stay. But when I was 17, it was like, oh, God, I got to go somewhere. So uh, I left with my best friend. She joined the Army too. We both went to Germany and um, started our adventures. And everything was, Pretty fine and on course until seven months before I finished law school. And that's when my son passed away. He was nine and a half. He was my only child. And three days later, my grandma Hannah passed. And I finished law school drinking. And I before grades were even posted and I knew I had graduated, I moved to Sacramento with my best friend from the Army. And Probably within a month, I was using meth every day. I was just that vulnerable. I had experimented with drugs before, but never been addicted to anything. I just Mm -hmm. lost my self-worth when I lost my son and my faith, I'm afraid, for a long time. And then I started trying to get it back together, and I moved back to Michigan, Indiana. Uh, But I got back with the guy I ended up marrying, who was abusive and who got busted dealing and should have had a 25 year minimum because of the mandatory minimums and prosecutors dealing for cooperation. He did probably about five years and I did 
over 15 and was only peripherally involved. So the issue of, of federal conspiracy is very close to my heart because of how directly it and horribly it impacted me and my family. So if we can just, just backtrack and, and dig in a little bit into the details of your case. At the point in time when uh, – was he still your husband at the time that, that he was arrested and were you still married or were you divorced at that point? Um, we were separated. I, he had told everyone we knew if I ever left him, he would kill me. And I believed that. And I left and moved uh, an hour away. He didn't know where I lived or worked or anything when he got busted. And yet when he did get busted before the DEA even left the house, he had told him that the drugs belonged to me. And we had absolutely no contact during that time, but they don't care. They don't care how accurate the information is. They call it cooperation anyway. And they, they made me out to be a kingpin without ever checking my bank records. They, um, they assumed that I was in contact with him when I absolutely was not. And they could have checked our phone records. They did nothing to substantiate the case. And, at that time, the guidelines were mandatory. And as you know, the federal system has no parole. So they threatened me with taking my case before a jury made up of northern Indiana farmers and explaining to them how meth was the scourge of the earth back in 99 and that I would get life and the feds don't have parole. So did I want to plead to 235 months, five months less than 20 years? because of the weight of all the drugs from all these conspirators. They put 32 people in my conspiracy and I wouldn't have been able to pick 20 of them out of a lineup, honestly. And they added all that weight and used that to determine my guideline level and put me where the low end of my guideline level was 235 months. And that's what the judge gave me. He could not give me any less time. What what type of legal representation did you have? Did you hire your own attorney or was no, it? No, I had a defender. I had a federal defender. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I try not to what if, you know, mm -hmm. because I believe that God has a plan for me and that things work out the way that, that they're supposed to. And I don't know if I hadn't done all that time, would I be clean now? Would, you know, would I have survived reentry? Because it's, it's a rocky landing and, you know, people don't think that it is or it should be, but you know, when you, when I work as an office person and I've been gone for 15 years and the whole tech revolution happened during that time, mm -hmm. there's some adjustment going on on so many levels that, it's hard to relate other than with someone else who's been there and, and is making the same transition or someone who's done it successfully. So what, what year did you go in then? 1999. 1999. So yeah, let's talk about that. The difference there. It's just technology wise. So <laughs> 1999, hey, were you even using a computer at that point in time? Probably a little bit. A little bit. Yeah. And I had the uh, Motorola flip phone with the, in mm -hmm. the leather case you could put on your belt. And then once you open it, you pull up the antenna. Yeah. Yeah, I remember That's that. That's how high tech I was. <laughs> <laughs> Most people didn't have cell phones then. Cell phone bills were like $1,200 if you were roaming anywhere. So, mm -hmm. oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I remember the first cell phones, the old... Uh, the old Zach Morris cell phone on, on Saved by the Bell that was as big as a, a brick. But, uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> um, so let, let's talk about – so you get accused of this. The, the prosecutors are building this case against you. At what point in time did you start to think, holy shit, I could actually go to prison here for more than a decade? When, when did that hit you? I was um, – I, I was really – Kind of in a fog and I'm and I'm thinking to myself they never said anything in law school about people doing time in America without any kind of evidence there's no physical evidence there's no drugs they never searched my house and they had every opportunity I had never even tested positive for drugs at that point so 
I was thinking there's just absolutely no way this can happen. And but they don't really teach you a lot about federal criminal law in law school. You know, I was picked up out of state and transported back to northern Indiana and met my lawyer. And he was like, at first he was saying, you know, I'd love to take it to the box and everything. And the next time I met him, he was like reading me Psalms out of the Bible. I was like, what happened? And, but it was so prosecutor controlled at that point, the federal system, because the guidelines were mandatory. The, the agents and the prosecutors would work together and figure out how much time they wanted you to do for whatever reason. Maybe it was because I had a law degree and they did not. Maybe it was because I had a nice hot tub. I don't know. But they decide who they're going to stick and and they did. Um, now, were, were you practicing as a lawyer at the time no, then? No. no okay. I passed the Indiana bar in February of 98. And I was high, honestly. Um, I was never sworn into practice before my ex-husband was busted and implicated me. So I never practiced before I got locked up. And, you know, I do now. I just right. got my yeah, yeah. last month. That will con- congratulations. Thank you. That is awesome. <laughs> so that that has to be just the, the most satisfying feeling to after every, everything you've been through to pass the bar and be admitted. Be be, be an attorney. I mean, being being able to do, yeah. do what you want to. It's uh, like I said. It's everything I wanted to do since I was a small child, and um, I I'm finally able to practice and I want to focus my practice in criminal law with um, recovery courts, with um, clients who are in need of recovery Mm -hmm. or in recovery. And um, that's where my heart is. And I want to help people with federal criminal cases because you really have to you really have to have an inside out knowledge of those guidelines in order to in order to get the the reductions that you should before your sentence because it's set up so that you really can't go back and fix anything i mean um <clears throat> there are reductions or at least the judge can consider things like the fact that i was a veteran the fact that of the loss that I had gone through, the fact that I was a battered spouse, um, all kinds of factors that should have been considered that just were not. Um, clearly, I was self-medicating with drugs and alcohol, and I should have had a psych eval and actually asked for one. And I never even got one because that may have reduced my sentence. So was your sentence a plea deal or was did you take yeah. it to trial? It was. Yes, because they said if I went to trial, I would get life. And the feds don't have parole. They've not had parole, I think, since 1987. That's incredible. Now, is any of that being proposed to change with this new, um, with the new prison reform bill that's coming through? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, Um, I thought so. They are hoping to change things right away, like uh, women who are pregnant should not be shackled. Um, that's one of the things that's, that would be a horrific situation to find yourself in. Um, they're also changing some of the laws that reduced drug guidelines, um, and making them retroactive to people who've been sentenced because a lot of times new laws will go through, but it's, it's prospectively where, if you're facing time, that might affect your sentence. But if you're already sentenced, sorry about your lock. Mm-hmm. This is what happened to me. You won't believe this. So my sentence was 235 months. I get all the way to the end of my sentence, six different places. And I was in the drug program. At the end of the drug program, I got a one-year sentence reduction when I graduated. And um, and then I got nine months halfway house, the end of my incarceration time. So I did over 15 years inside, then almost three months in a halfway house that was horrible. And then 
six months on home confinement. And 17 days later, the law went retroactive that reduced all the drug crimes by two points on the sentencing guidelines. And my sentence of incarceration was reduced by 47 months. You heard me say 17 days after I was on probation. Right. Oh my gosh. Because in the federal system, you still have that federal probation after your sentence, after the prison, the halfway house, the home confinement, after all of that is done successfully, you still have that period of supervision, which they don't call parole because they don't parole people. You don't get it off of your sentence. That's in addition. So, how long does the probation last for? Uh, Mine was scheduled to be five years. And then when I went before the character and fitness committee to, to ask to take the bar exam, they wouldn't let me test because I was on probation. I was still on probation. And so at that point I went to the judge where my probation was and, and I put in, I put in, a motion to get my, my term of supervision reduced. And because my incarceration couldn't be reduced 47 months. And because I had never even been written up the whole time I was locked up. um, And because it was keeping me from attaining my career, the judge went ahead and ordered my supervision terminated at about 22 months. That probably doesn't happen very often. That's that's great that it happened for you. Um, I'm curious. So going in, in, in uh, when you pass the bar, going in front of the character and fitness board, right? And I, I don't know if you're allowed to talk about this or not. So if you can't, then, then don't. But ha- how hard was that? What, what type of questions were you asked? I mean, was it? When I first went uh, in front of the board, there was a man there. This was January, January, no, February of 2016. There was a man there who was asking me questions about, uh, do I remember saying what I said to a police officer in Kansas in 1998? Um, Well, you know, first of all, I was high. Second of all, that's 18 years ago and 15 of that I spent in prison and I've been dealing with, you know, bigger kettles of fish. So, Mm -hmm. um, and it was very, it was a very harsh experience. And what they told me was, come back in four years, or when you're off probation, whichever is later. And in the meantime, we want to see you continue to be proactive in your recovery and volunteer in the community. And I volunteer at the battered women's shelter because I have experience in that. I volunteer at the local women's halfway house because I have experience in that. And um, So when my paper was cut off at 22 months, I thought, you know, no way they're going to let me, but it's worth a shot. So I wrote back to Character and Fitness. They had new members by then. And they said, yeah, come on down and talk to us. And I went down and they said, yeah, you can you can apply for next time. So I ended up I'm not supposed to be off probation until October 15th of 2020. I have a law license. So it was an uphill battle. You know, being told come back in four years was, I mean, knocked the stuff out of me for a little bit, you know, but I have such a strong support group around me and um, people I can bounce things off of who are just determined to not let me give up on myself. And uh, I did it. I stuck with it and I saw it through and. I did it. And that's the most important thing when you get out, you know, is to to surround yourself with people who are where you want to be or know at least know where you want to be and care to see you get there. You know, going home to the same old, you know, they say in recovery, people, places and things, nothing to be gained by that. The cannabis industry has rapidly expanded. For those liberty lovers who want to take advantage of this growing industry, they've been met with a flood of government taxes and regulation. A lot of cannabis companies would just love to hire a full-time CFO, but that could be super, super expensive. But what if you could have the knowledge 
and experience of this full-time CFO at a fraction of the cost. If you're in the cannabis business or you plan on entering the fray, then you need to schedule a free consultation with the Grow CFO, Rachel Kennerly. The Grow CFO will help to maximize cost of goods sold deductions by employing accrual and cost accounting, creating tax savings and improving cash flow. They will keep your books in an audit-ready state. If you or someone you know is either already in the cannabis industry or thinking about jumping in the fray, go to thegrowcfo.com and schedule a free consultation today. That's, I mean, that's such important advice for for all parts of life. I mean, and pe- people, it's it's funny. I mean, even some of the people that are closest to you will try to try to hold you down or pull you back. So. Yeah. It's tough. You have to surround yourself with people who are supportive and positive and uh, are going to cheer you on as you chase your dreams, which is awesome. That's that's, that's what you have. That's so important. So I, I want to ask you about, and maybe you had support. I'm sure you did for this as well. Your, the book that you wrote in prison, yeah. Prison Bitch. What was the motivation for that? And tell us a little bit about you know what your your goals and objectives were when you were writing that book. Well, one thing was to vent. It was kind of cathartic. <laughs> At that point, I was locked up for over 11 years and was up to here with everything and mm-hmm. um, just needed to, you know, sit in my room. I wrote it longhand and um, it just came out. Was, you know? was that because you didn't have access to a computer or just because you wanted to write it that way? Um, both. I mean, I could have typed it, but the only computers were where people wanted to go and and get their email too. And so that's, you know, I didn't want to waste their resources and, and it was okay for me. I, maybe that was part of the process that I needed then. But the reason was actually because they have people from the local community who go visit inmates. It's called prison visitation support. And a lady who came in to see me when I was in Florida and a long ways from my family uh, told me about her daughter who was sentenced for a money crime federally, and her sentence was two years or less. And rather than turn herself in, she had committed suicide. And that um, just weighed very heavily on me. And I thought, you know, I've, I've done 11 years of this, and it's a lot of crap, and it's far from my family, but certainly I, I've made it through it, and in better condition than I was coming in just because of of choosing to be clean and sober because, you know, you have access to the whole gamut of things, especially in camps or behind a fence, even because of um, they pay officers to bring things in, you know, that's no secret. I just wanted to share that. If I can do this, you can do this. If I can do this and I'm in my 11th year, you can do it for, you know, a couple of months. You can do it for 20 years if you have to do it. You can do it. And it really, it's just humorous and mostly pokes fun at 20 different aspects of life inside women's federal prisons and camps for everything from um, the food to the laundry, to the staff, to, um, you know, other inmates, anything you can think of is pretty much in there. And I'm picking on it, even including myself. And, Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of it is about the really, enduring friendships that are forged there and the the things that you have in common with people and the things that you learn in common with people and you know the ability to interact with people from such diverse culture and learn so much um and and other ways about positively spending my time trying to do constructive things and a lot of those things being my ways to stay connected with my family because I was so far away. When you're in federal prison, you're not in the state that you're from, typically, especially if you're a woman. There are only so many women's federal facilities. So when I got locked up, I was in, I'm from Michigan. They put me behind a fence. The only facilities like that available then were Connecticut, Texas, Florida, and California. That's not close to Michigan. So that means, you know, you're not getting visits and you have to learn to get by with that. I mean, fortunately, the telephone system evolved, so I didn't have to keep calling collect forever. Mm -hmm. 
So how else did you keep in touch just through phone calls, writing letters, things like that? And um, I learned to or relearned how to crochet and then knit. And then I taught people how to do those things. Mm -hmm. But mostly I would find patterns and I would make things for my family, my sisters, my brother, my sister-in-law, um, all my nieces and nephews, my mom, my stepdad, and mail them home. Most of the money I got in prison went to yarn and postage. But, um, and I would be making things that the kids either requested or that I wanted to surprise them with. And then I got good enough. Actually, I could um, design my own things and, and make up things for them out of my head. And um, actually, I sold a crochet pattern to a magazine while I was locked up. Um, something oh, I made wow. for my family. Yeah. So there are lots of different ways of of being productive and making productive use of your time there. And the whole time I was working on a project for someone I love, I just feel close to that person. And that's, you know, that kept me going. That kept my my heart from turning into a cold, hard pit, I guess. And um, gave me a lot of time to think and, and work on forgiveness. And I don't even use the word hate. And there were some there were some shady characters in my life, and hopefully they've all had a, an opportunity to reflect and change too. I don't know. Well, that's that's a testament to you, and you know I, I don't know if I could if I could forgive that easily. I know I, I'm I'm a Christian and and I try to, but it's I mean after being through something like that, I'm sure it's I'm sure it was not easy to uh, for you to get to that point. I just want to ask you a couple couple more questions. Um, I know we're running short on time here, but so if somebody's listening or maybe a family member of someone listening who's about to go into prison or maybe they're in prison, um, what sort of ad- advice would you have for that family member on you know, how best to help out, how to, how to help um, that individual behind bars cope? First of all, send them my book because What it does, I think, is take away the fear of the unknown. And that's a very powerful fear. When Mm -hmm. you're going into something for a stretch that you don't even know how long it could turn out to be and have absolutely no idea what's on the other side of the, the door on your bus, then you're frightened, no matter how tough you act. And and I was, you know, one who didn't cry in front of people and all that too, but it's scary. And I tried to address all those things like, okay, so then I went here and this happened and this is how I dealt with it. And maybe this is how I should have dealt with it. But, you know, or, or things that you see that I've saw other people do. Um, I think that my book is really helpful to someone who's about to start time. As far as what your family can do, <clears throat> they can get on the, website usually and find out for themselves how do I go about visiting when can I visit what can I bring when I visit what can I mail to my loved one um how do I put money on their books um can I send them books I read thousands of books in 15 years I mean it was crazy and such a variety of things that it's just amazing. Did you get to a point that you were speed reading the books that you were reading at such a, at a rapid pace or? Um, some, there are a few, like, I remember um, the green mile by Stephen King. I read like that. And um, some Janet Ivanovich books that are very funny. And um, even, I mean, I read the twilight books and I read the game of Thrones books and a lot of religious books and true crime and oh my goodness, classics. But um, that's that's interesting that being in prison that you would want to read true crime books. I know. I guess as a I guess as a lawyer, you know that's uh... maybe that's what it was. <laughs> but um, <clears throat> to find out what you can send in because anything that they have that's from you. Is going to be so meaningful to them in there. I had a small bulletin board over my bed and my family would send me in pictures and they had to know 
how many they can send in and what size they can be and what kind of paper they have to be on. Find those kinds of things out. And then I could have pictures on the bulletin board over my bed. And so I always had newer pictures of my nieces and nephews and, and my family pictures and pictures from visits. And it just meant so much to me that it was right there, you know, where I, where I could always see my people. Um, but kind of, and also my book has, um, parts in it about things like this that explain <clears throat> how the phone systems work and how the mail systems work. Um, rules change too often to keep up with. And that's kind of sad because, you know, at one time in the federal system, families could send in packages with street clothes and different things. And then, you know, they phased that out and now it's all uniforms. And, but if you take it upon yourself to find out what that prison has for rules as far as mail and visits, especially, mm -hmm. um, and how to put money on their books. Um, whether they have email, do they have Skype? Because some places do. And that's valuable to know because Absolutely. otherwise, you know, I'm, I would be on the inside and I'm the inmate and I'm trying to get this information and we don't have internet. We might have the rules in the, in the law library and someone might've taken them out of there, you know, because mm -hmm. they needed them more than anyone else. So, you know, we didn't always have good resources on the inside. And if they ask you something or to do something or to get something for them, if it's possible to do it, try and make it a point to do it. Um, because it's tough on the inside when, you know, you ask what seems like a small favor or it would have been on mm -hmm. the outside or you would be happy to, you know, you would have been happy to do for someone and then it doesn't get done and it's just not addressed and you feel like, Nobody wants to help you. You feel powerless. Yeah. And it sort of highlights, uh, I would assume it highlights that, that lack of freedom that you have, just something yeah. that you just want to get done and you, you can't you can't do it. So resourceless. Even if you have mm -hmm. email, you have to understand it's just an email program. Mm -hmm. You type in your message and you send it out. And I know when I was in the federal system, you couldn't attach pictures, you couldn't anything. And the, they would go in and out. And the person on the inside is paying like um, five cents a minute to read those emails and to type them. And so they're paying to use that system. And, but there's no kind of, of Gmail or Google or anything available. It, there's a, uh, I'm in Pennsylvania and I, I just read an article about this a couple months ago. I think this passed and they're doing it, which is it's terrible where there's a third party company that every letter that an inmate writes is sent to this third party company and it's scanned into a database the uh, the actual letter is set aside and the scan a scanned copy is sent to the family member just just ridiculous wow so, but, that takes the personal absolutely out of it it takes away the paper they wrote on and everything mm -hmm. I think I think if I remember right, that goes it goes both ways. So if you try to send pictures in or something like that, they just get scanned. So and wow, maybe I'm wrong, but I think it's all black and white, which is just obviously much much uh, worse. But that is terrible when technology is so far on the outside, it just makes people feel <laughs> even further removed from society, mm -hmm. and that serves no one. Um, when I got out, the feds have uh, had a policy where their people who are who go to the halfway house can't have smartphones. No one, mm -hmm. no matter what your crime. So we had to get what we call a stupid phone, and you know a flip phone basically with no mm -hmm. uh, no internet access or anything. And it was horrible. I had been away for 15 years. I needed to know to start learning how to use a smartphone, and was prohibited from doing that. And I mean, there are so many rules that keep people back instead of helping them to move forward. And I guess I know I want to 
be an activist. I want to honor the Can Do Foundation and Amy Pova because she did mm -hmm. so much for me from the beginning of her foundation. And, um, and I want to be able to narrow my focus because there's so much that needs to be fixed. And I feel like I won't have any power in my voice at all if I'm just scattershot. And so I know um, that the conspiracy law is, is wrong. They try to make everything out to be organized crime and it's not, um, especially in drug cases, unless you're a cartel, it's, you know, usually addicts and they need help. They don't need prison. Mm -hmm. So I guess that's the thing. The first thing that speaks to my heart. Well, that's, that's awesome. I'm so happy that you have the opportunity to, to do that. You've made it through so much. You're a lawyer now. And Thank you. I know we're, we're over on time, but I just want to ask you one more question because I think this will really so relate to people who have been to prison, who haven't been to prison, who are trying just to achieve really any goal in life. So all you've been through, the tragedy that you suffered through, the addiction, getting arrested, convicted, spending all this time in prison, but holding in your mind, holding this vision that you wanted to become a lawyer. I'm sure along the way, there were points in time when you thought you couldn't do it, you doubted yourself. My question is, what kinds of tricks or what kinds of things did you use in order to focus yourself, to keep yourself motivated, to keep yourself uh, looking at that goal? Because, I mean, just to be able to accomplish that, I mean, I think it's so impressive. So to give others the opportunity to, to learn from it, I think is tremendous value. I think um, during the time that you're gone, you have to, <clears throat> you have to be able to communicate with someone who's doing what you want to do. I was able to stay in contact with my own attorney, who's now the, the chief federal defender in Fort Wayne. And, um, and he always encouraged me. And you need to know, you need to be determined in the whys of what you want to do. Uh, and the hows will come. If, if your reasons are pure, then a way is going to be made for you. And you need to surround yourself with people who are positive, who have positive energy, and who, who want to see you succeed. And I've been blessed with so much of that when I was in and on the outside. And the people that you meet on the inside, if you go inside, make them the positive people because there are so many of them there. Um, there are a lot of people that want to sit down and talk about other people there and never look at themselves or what brought them there. And then there are people who take that time to reflect and, you know, pray to do better um, given an opportunity. So that's what I did. I kept just trying to learn everything I could. I got licensed as a cosmetologist, a forklift driver, a CDL driver. I was driving semis and, I mean, anything I could do, I, I became a personal fitness trainer and I taught other ladies Pilates for 10 years. Anything that you can do to give back, to be positive, to help make others' time better on the inside or the outside. Why would you not do that if you have an opportunity? And that all comes back to you. Well, that is tremendous advice, I think, for, for anyone out there. Thanks. So thank you. Thank you so much, Lisa, for coming on the show, for sharing your story. Certainly. And you know, I'm sure I'm sure this will really be a value to a lot of people. Great. Thank you very much. The book is Prison Bitch. It's on Amazon. It's by 38671-018. It's $9.99 on Amazon or $5.99 on LeanPub as a download. Ebook. Okay, well, I'll definitely link to it on the show notes page for, for this show right there so people can just go grab it there. And uh, awesome. Thank you very much. Hope you guys enjoyed my interview today with Lisa Hanna. Another incredible story here on Felony Friday. Uh, you know, it's they continue, these stories continue to blow me away. Lisa, it's almost unbelievable that she was able to overcome all the obstacles in front of her when most people would give up, would quit, would say it's not worth it, it's too hard, um, this is just too unfair, this and just throw in the towel. She didn't quit. 
and she continued on and became a lawyer. She got she passed the bar and got sworn in. And I mean, she makes it sound like it wasn't that hard. My God, can you imagine how hard it was? Can you imagine mentally how hard that is to get past that when you're when you're stuck in prison, when you're locked in a cage for a crime that you did not commit? It's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. And to to not carry resentment and and these feelings with you that you were screwed over and wronged and just allow that to use that as a crutch. I have so much respect and admiration for Lisa Hanna. Um, I continue I continue to be amazed by the guests who come on this show. And I hope, I do hope, that the Felony Friday listeners out there, the loyal listeners of this show, understand how rare this is, how rare it is to find these stories. I hope you guys are sharing this show. I hope you are. And, you know, we have some things coming in the works with Felony Friday that we're going to make it easier for you guys to share Felony Friday. I'm not going to go into the details, but I want to make Felony Friday easier to share with maybe your friends who aren't libertarians. So I've probably said enough you can figure out what's going on, but we're going to create a separate feed for Felony Friday. Felony Friday will stay in the Lions of Liberty podcast feed forever. We'll always have the three shows. It's a great package of shows. Mark interviewing the great libertarian minds and hosting roundtables. Brian doing current events, talking comedy, culture, liberty, wrapping all up in a bow with his very vulgar and uh, angry personality. That's just a beautiful thing. And then myself on Friday, um, talk about injustice in this uh, just horrible, horribly unjust criminal justice system. That's a great thing for libertarians. And, you know, more libertarians should be listening to all three of these shows because it's, uh, you get everything you need with one stop at Lions of Liberty. So subscribe if you haven't, and please leave us a five-star rating and a review when you do because it, it Helps us out a lot. I'm not going to lie to you. It helps. It's going to help us reach more ears. So that's great for libertarians. This variety show is, it's been built with libertarians in mind. But there's a lot of people out there who are liberals, progressives, conservatives, who maybe aren't fully on board with a lot of the stuff we're talking about. Maybe they haven't had time to think about it. Maybe they just haven't had the right conversation with someone and their mind's not open. That's okay. That's reality. That's where we are. With that being said, I think a lot of them would listen to Felony Friday right now, love it, and share it. But unfortunately, I think that some people, a lot of libertarians, are afraid to share it right now because it's in a feed that is a libertarian feed. We're hardcore here. We're big time libertarians. I mean, I wouldn't, maybe, I don't know. People throw around the word anarchist. Uh, you know, I, I don't like labels like that. I just like to say I'm for individual rights all of the time. Uh, voluntarist. I like that a little little bit better than anarchist, but that's a, a little bit hardcore to throw a progressive into, to throw a conservative into, and expect them to stick around. So we're going to make it easier to share Felony Friday. It's going to have, Felony Friday is going to be published in two places. So it'll be in a separate feed as well, where you can share that feed. And <clears throat> we're going to go through the archives and publish those as well in that feed. So every Tuesday we'll have something called like, I don't know, off the top of my head, Time Travel Tuesday. How's that sound? Do you like it? Let me know what you think. Actually, reach out to me on Twitter, um, at John Odermatt, on Instagram, at John Odermatt. Send me an email, felonyfriday at lionsofliberty.com, or just come in the Lions of Liberty Forum on Facebook. You can find that by going to Facebook, typing Lions of Liberty Forum in the search bar at the top, and join. It's free to get in, the Lions of Liberty Forum. Do that. Please uh, let me know what you think. Let me know what you think of this change going forward. If you're going to utilize it and share the show, if you're excited about it, and let me know what you think about what should we call the Tuesday uh, archive episode where we bring on these these older because so many so many great stories that I, I can't wait to dig through them and uh, and start start playing them again and, and getting them out to a wider audience. I'm really looking forward to it. So that's coming in the new year. I don't have a date, a launch date, but I'll get that to you soon. I'm excited about it. What else? What else? Um, join the pride. How about that? If you like what you hear, if you want us to keep doing this, I'm taking on more work, starting another feed. So I'm doing that for, for you guys. I don't get paid anything for this. I'm doing this to 
advance the ideas of liberty. I'm doing this to I'm doing this to educate people to really and I think criminal justice reform smacks people in the face. When they see what someone like Lisa Hanna has been through, they see how unjust this broken system is. That starts to wake them up and they start to think about other things. They start to think about what well, how's this possible? They've been voting one way or the other their whole life. They don't understand that the people who they're voting for are responsible for what happens to a person like Lisa Hannett. It is directly the people that we elect. It's it's their fault. <clears throat> We're electing the wrong people. So I'm getting a little bit off track, but I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, expanding the audience we have here at Felony Friday. Join the pride. Go to patreon.com slash lines of liberty. I didn't finish that last thought. Little as five dollars a month, you get all our bonus content. Different levels up: 10, 15, 25. You get more stuff. Twenty-five. You get a conference call with us every month, where you can ch- every month where you can chime in. In fact, it was on that last conference call where it was brought up that Felony Friday should be branched off to reach a wider audience. We took that input. We're running with it. You too can influence this show. So please join us. Join us in the Lions of Liberty Pride. We also have an exclusive Pride Facebook group as well, which. People are loving. That's all I got. That's all I got. It's been a long show today. Hopefully you enjoyed it. And yeah, this is John Odermatt signing off. Always remember to keep your head up and the fires of Liberty burning. Burning.